This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. Today is the Feast of the Queenship of Mary. Hopefully at your parish today you will hear a homily on the Queenship of Our Lady from your priest. If not, well, maybe this will suffice. It's from Father John A. Harden, and it's called Our Lady of the Rosary, the Coronation of Our Lady. Just a quick aside, this was originally given as a conference talk, and it's a trans it's from a transcript of a conference talk he gave a long time ago. And that's why he uses less formal language than you might hear and more and less formal like cadence and less formal manner of speaking than you would hear if I was merely reading to you something he had written. So bear that in mind because it gets a because he gets a little informal with his language here, which is not a bad thing in my mind. Anyway, happy feast day, and let me know in the comments if your priest at your parish gave a homily in any way about Our Lady, whether it was about the Immaculate Conception, which was also earlier this month, or the Queenship of Mary, or anything else. Just let me know in the comments. Anyway, God bless. Today's topic is on the fifth glorious mystery, the coronation of Our Lady. Implied, coronation of Mary as Queen of Heaven and of Earth. All Mariologists in com commenting on the Rosary say this closing mystery is a summary of all the Marian mysteries of the Catholic Church. If we ask why, the answer is very simple. All the previous 14 mysteries deal essentially with events in the life of Jesus and Mary that took place on earth, from the Annunciation of Our Lady and Christ's conception in her womb at Nazareth up to Christ's ascension and Mary's assumption. They both, we may say, took place at least initially the starting point was still on earth. But Mary's coronation took place in heaven. Our planned scope for this meditation co will cover the following aspects of what we keep repeating are mysteries of the rosary, meaning they are truths of our faith that we should try to grow in understanding, but will never, even in the endless reaches of eternity, fully comprehend. First, what does the church mean by the coronation of the Blessed Virgin Mary? Second, why? Why do we honor Mary as queen and therefore commemorate her coronation in heaven? And finally, always back to earth, how should Our Lady's queenship affect our personal and collective spiritual lives? First, then, the meaning of the coronation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The term coronation obviously means the crowning of someone with royal dignity. Now, nobody is crowned with royal dignity unless the person being thus crowned has a right and a claim to the coronation. It therefore means the public recognition that someone either already is or is thereby declared to be king or queen. When then we see that Mary was crowned in heaven and the mystery follows her bodily assumption, we mean that on reaching heaven she was immediately, and I've got three verbs here, recognized as queen, acknowledged as queen, and publicly, universally, and we have to add, eternally honored as queen. If further we ask, who was it who crowned Our Lady? Again, I've got two verbs. We must say it was ultimately the Holy Trinity. Whatever God does outside of himself, outside of his own Trinitarian life, we believe is always done by all three persons, and we should ask simultaneously and further add equally. If we ask why, why should the Holy Trinity have crowned Our Lady? Because she was the daughter of God the Father, the mother of God the Son, and as the Church has been saying since the Annunciation, the spouse of the Holy Spirit. She had been that, of course, before her assumption, but there's a difference in being something and becoming acknowledged and recognized and publicly honored for who and what you are. That we believe was done since Our Lady reached heaven in body and soul. Having said that in answer to the question, who crowned Our Lady, we answer, it must ultimately have been the Holy Trinity. However, more approximately, we may say that on reaching heaven, Mary was crowned by her divine Son, to whom she gave a human nature. Because, and we've got to always keep this on one side, Mary is queen because her son is king. But then let's make sure that Christ's kingship is not only what it had been from the time of creation as the second person of the Holy Trinity. Oh no, Christ is king not only as God, Christ is king as God become man. The church therefore encourages us to say that ultimately and finally it was the Holy Trinity. Yet proximately or immediately, if you wish, who did the coronation? It was her divine son. Ah, uh, yes, but her divine son, who was her son as man, and divine because he was the son of the everlasting father. That was the first preposition. Mary was crowned by her divine son, to whom she gave a human nature. Second, for whom she provided all the care and devotion of a loving mother on earth. Mary's coronation, we may say, was coming to her. Otherwise, and this did not actually happen, she might as well have said after her assumption, 
Well now, son, after all that I've done for you, pardon me, isn't there some recognition that I will get from you? I repeat, that never happened. Third preposition. She was crowned by her divine son with whom she had stood under his cross on Calvary, and finally by whom she was taken body and soul into heavenly glory. All this is locked up in the verb crowning, or the noun coronation. I believe that it is more than instructive to recall that up to the 16th century there were many litanies of Our Lady. I never counted them, all I know is there were quite a few. But in the 16th century, remember, it is during the 16th century that the Church added what we now call the second part of the Hail Mary, remember. It had only been the Ave Maria up to the name Jesus, but in the 16th century the Church added the Sancta Maria, the Holy Mary. And the reason, as we recall, is to make sure that the tragic Nestorian heresy that had stricken the Church in the early 5th century and which penetrated Protestantism in the 16th century, that those who would remain believing Catholics would have no doubt that Mary is Mother of God. Because, you see, the first part of what we call the Hail Mary. Let's say it together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. All of that is veneration, praise. There is not one word of invocation. Ah, the church wanted to make sure that those who were believing Catholics would not only venerate Mary, but also invoke her. And that is why the 16th century on every believing Catholic goes on. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. There is not a single prayer of invocation of Mary in all the world, Protestantism anywhere, anywhere. Prayer, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. There is not a single prayer of invocation anywhere else. So let's make sure what we believe and that we know what we believe when we believe in Mary as the one who was the Mother of God, and whom, then, we should invoke to obtain from her what we need. We go back to our reflection that in the 16th century it was Pope St. Pius V, the great Dominican Pope and promoter of the Holy Rosary. He decided only one litany from now on from the 16th century will be the litany in the Catholic Church, and he chose what had come to be known as the Litany of Loretto. And guess why Pope St. Pius V chose that litany? History tells us because of the muddle of invocations of Mary as Queen. We can invoke Our Lady by many titles. The Pope wanted to make sure one title would stand out, Mary as Queen. Over the centuries, especially since Pope St. Pius V, other Roman pontiffs have added invocations to Mary as Queen and are now part of the Litany of Our Lady. It is in fact a widespread custom to add the Litany of Our Lady, invocations which the Pope have decided on and listen to this, and to use the Litany with which to end the Rosary. Do you do that? All I know, that's the way we were brought up from the novitiate going back to the time, I would like to say this, of St. Ignatius. In other words, you say the Rosary. So you've said the Rosary. Then you say the Litany of Our Lady. So you say the Litany of Our Lady. Then you close the Litany of Our Lady by invoking her as Queen. Religious communities over the centuries have been authorized by the Holy See to have private invocations of their own, like the Jesuits, who conclude the Litany of Loretto with the prayer. Queen of the Society of Jesus, pray for us. I can safely say this is part of the rule of the Society of Jesus. Though I think I told you in one of the mystical appearances of Our Lady to St. Ignatius, when he was seriously thinking of calling the order, he was founding the Society of Mary, Our Lady appeared to St. Ignatius and said, Don't you dare, it must be the Society of my Son, Jesus. Second area of reflection, why is Mary honored as Queen? Our Lady's right to be addressed as Queen goes back to the Annunciation. Let's briefly recall what the angel told Our Lady. You shall conceive in your womb and shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He shall be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. And he shall be king over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom there shall be no end. We repeat the question, why is Mary honored as mother? Because, well, she deserves to be honored as queen. Could you be more specific, though? And sure, Our Lady was thus honored in heaven on her assumption because she conceived and gave birth to Jesus Christ, the King of the universe. She is the queen mother. Why is Mary to be honored as queen? Because she cooperated with her son, always, of course, under his authority, in establishing the kingdom of God on earth, and we must add, in the triumphant church, the kingdom of heaven. Except for her, there wouldn't be a church. There wouldn't be a mystical body for the best of reasons. There wouldn't have been a Jesus Christ, and there can be no mystical body without a head. We repeat the question, why is Mary to be honored as queen? Because on Calvary she was appointed by her son to be the queen mother of the church. Because on Pentecost her presence and prayers obtain, the church tells us, the descent of the Holy Spirit sent by her son as king to sanctify the kingdom that he had founded. Finally, because in her assumption she was reun reunited with her son. He in body and soul, 
she in body and soul to reign with him, always, un always under him. Nevertheless, we may use the preposition with him as queen. Perhaps the most explicit, and as far as I could find out, the most extensive explanation of why and how Mary is queen was, a stat was expressed by the same Roman pontiff, Pope Pius XII, when in the Marian year, 1954, he instituted a new feast, the Feast of the Queenship of Mary, which is now celebrated on August 22nd, the octave day of Our Lady's Assumption. The definition came, as we know, in 1950 of Mary's Assumption. The formal declaration of Mary's queenship in 1954, to be exact, December 8th, 1954, which, in case you may have forgotten, was exactly 100 years since the definition of Mary's Immaculate Conception by Pius XII's predecessor, another Pius, Pius IX. Here is the statement. In my business, some people make soap or sell toothpaste. My business is theology. In my business, the best, clearest, and sharpest declaration of the Church on what we mean by Mary's queenship was addressed to the world by Pius XII on the date we've given to the encyclical called Ad Celi Reginum, to the Queen of Heaven. I quote Pius XII. The Blessed Virgin has not only been given the highest degree of excellence and perfection after Christ, but also shares in the power which her Son and our Redeemer exercises over the minds and wills of men. For if the word of God through the human nature assumed by him works miracles and gives grace, if he uses the sacraments and uses his saints as instruments for the salvation of souls, why should he not use his Blessed Mother's office and activity to bring us the fruits of redemption? Unquote. What is the Pope saying? Clearly, all the blessings of salvation, all the grace, all the benediction, all the light for the mind, all the strength for the will, all the supernatural life that we need to reach heaven must come from God. But, says the Pope, the principal means, the principal instruments that God become man uses to exercise his power, which I've underlined in my quotation, the principal instrument that Christ uses is his mother. In other words, Our Lady is queen because, hear it, she's got power. I have to say this. She is no nominal monarch like the Queen of England. She's got authority. She has influence. She has rights. She is the mother and, therefore, the Queen of the Son of God, who is the King of heaven and earth. We have one more important and practical question to answer. How should have Mary's queenship influence our, our own spiritual life? It is now almost 2,000 years of devotion to Our Lady that those who believe in the divinity of her Son have paid his mother. The faithful who have known Mary have powerful influence over her Son. I would summarize these two millennia of Marian devotion, in other words, how Mary's queenship has over the centuries affected the lives of all authentic Catholics. I'd summarize this. It has to be in seven words. Learning, honor, thinking, speaking, invoking, imitating, and promoting. How are we to put into practice our faith in Mary's queenship as the mother of the king of all creation? First, learning about Mary, which is the basic respect we owe her as our queen. The last thing we dare do is ignore Our Lady. In practice, reading about Mary, hearing about Mary, studying, honest about Mary. Why? In order to enlighten our minds. If there is one area of our faith which we'd better grow in, we had better grow in our understanding of who Mary is. Second, by honoring Mary. This means we do something outside ourselves to show our homage to the Queen of the Universe. Like what? Like wearing medals. Like what? Like having statues. Like having images and, in general, any symbolic representation. Again, back to my own novitiate. You wouldn't dare turn in a paper unless on the top left corner was AMDG, Ad Majorium De Glorium, to the greater glory of God, and on the top right corner, BVMH, in the greater honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary. If I had not done that faithfully during my two years of novitiate, I'm absolutely sure I would not have been allowed to take my vows. I'm happy to report I still do, but to be sure, I have to tell myself, Harden, do you know whom you're writing to? Take another sheet of paper, honoring Mary, showing that we recognize we are creatures of flesh, and she, listen to this, in heaven has a pair of human eyes. Third, thinking of Mary. If there is one faculty over which our wills have control, let's be sure we know it is the faculty of thinking. We can either stop thinking or start thinking. I've seen it. I can prove it. We can think about A or B, or if we want to, Z. We can skip. Think about A for a moment, then skip to M, and then back to K. Third, thinking of Mary putting her, and I would like to add, keeping her on our minds. It's only logical to think about someone who we deeply venerate. Fourth, speaking to Mary, meaning that we have the rare privilege. Of course, we have to call on the resources to faith to realize what we're doing, but we're doing it here on earth, in case nobody told you. We're not in heaven. Yet. Not yet. She is. Isn't that marvelous? Honest. We can talk to her, our queen in heaven, and share with her our inmost thoughts and have 
a bodily voice, and now we've got to change. Remind ourselves she has bodily ears. Now, you may say that I'm allowing piety to get the better of your judgment. And no, I'm not. Don't you dare call me a pious simpleton. This is faith. Fifth, invoking Mary. This, again, is the logical consequence of our realizing who she is, how much power to go back to Pius XII's description of Mary's queenship. It's the authority, it's the power she's got, that for us, on a very earthly level, is what her queenship should mean to us. You want to get something done, you want to reach the top. So you either write or call up somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody else, who still knows somebody else who finally can get word to the one who's in charge, invoking Mary because we believe she has such power, and Christ has made sure over the centuries we realize how much power she's got. By whom have most of the attested miracles in Catholic Christianity for 2,000 years been performed? By whom? By his mother. And all of this we know. The miracles, for example, now for almost a hundred years at Lourdes, some astounding physical, marvelous works, like the one described by Alex Carell, the Nobel Prize winner, his little book, Voyage to Lourdes. He didn't have the heart to, to let one, one of his subjects go alone. He was a complete unbeliever, shall we say, made the mistake of going with her. This is the man who was honored by the whole world for the discovery, for some of his discoveries that have saved lives. I would not be speaking to you here this afternoon except for Alexis Carell, who helped save Father John's life. We'll just leave it at that because our hosts don't permit some of this stuff here to be said. Peabody describes that this woman was a miraculously restored at Lourdes in front of his eyes in terms, again, our hosts would not permit. Thanks, YouTube. <laughs> now, we're on number five, invoking Mary. Lourdes is not some footnote to our Catholic faith. The miracles worked here are God's reminder through his mother of the power she has to work, not only what is more dramatic, physical miracles in the body. She can and does work moral miracles in hearts and minds and wills of men and women totally estranged from God. Sixth, by imitating Mary. This is the highest honor we can pay to Mary as our queen, striving to pattern our lives on hers. We could go down the litany of Our Lady and repeat the virtues by which she is invoked, but I'll explain especially imitating our queen. First, in her unwavering faith. She believed the child she conceived was her God. She believed the child she nursed after his birth was her creator. She believed that the limp body on the cross was the Lord of angels and men. She believed. We can imitate her humility. The best English translation for Mary is identifying herself as handmaid. I know enough Greek to give you five other synonyms. That's the best translation, handmaid, which means humility. That does not mean, it cannot mean that Mary did not recognize the astounding gifts that she had. Otherwise, there would have been no Magnificat. That's not our problem. The problem we've got is that whatever we've got or whatever we think we are, unlike Our Lady, we are so unnaturally prone to not thank God and act on our own gratitude by never for a moment, not for one mental moment, taking credit for anything good in our lives. My friends, you try to do that for 24 hours, and I promise you, you'll have a hard job. Then, as Elizabeth told her, imitating Mary's absolute trust in God. Trusting in God means many things, but it surely means that God keeps the future closed to our eyes. All we have to do to live with is our past and the fleeting present. Mary, no more than we, during her stay on earth, could read the future. She trusted. Finally, we're asking ourselves, how are we to live our faith in Mary's queenship? By promoting the knowledge and love of the Blessed Virgin, promoting devotion to her Immaculate Heart by every means at our disposal and in every way, and I would add, in favor of every person even momentarily touches our lives. I've told too many of our so-called elder brothers, so-called separated brethren, when they did me whatever favor I was grateful for, I did not do it casually. What is your name? They tell me their name. I will say a rosary for you. A rosary? What's that? This in airports, where the lady at the ticket counter would, ch would change one of those, remember, unchangeable tickets, non-refundable, non-changeable. Oh, she said, it's been years since I've seen a rosary. Then, depending on the situation, how would you like to have one? Sure, I repeat, promoting, promoting devotion to the Queen of Heaven and Earth. She deserves it. I'd like to close with an unusual prayer addressed to Mary the Queen. It is the prayer of one of the great minds of the Church, St. Ephraim. My Immaculate and Thoroughly Pure Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Queen of the World, Hope of the Despairing, You are the joy of the saints, the peacemaker between sinners and God, the advocate of the abandoned, the haven of the shipwrecked. You are the consolation of the world, the ransom of captives, the comfortus of the afflicted, the salvation of the universe. O great Queen, we fly to your protection. We have no trust in anyone but you, O most faithful Virgin. After God, you are our only hope. We call ourselves your servants. Do not allow Satan to drag us into hell. Hail! 
most wonderful mediatrix between God and men, mother of our Savior, to whom be glory and honor with the, the Father and Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope you found those words of Father John Harden helpful. This, the, this was the transcript of a conference talk he gave in the late 80s, I think. And it is very, this is a very Orthodox Catholic subject for the, especially for today, the queenship of, of the Virgin Mary. And it was about a year, it was about three years ago to this day that um, Archbishop Vigano released his testimony and changed the state of the church, I think, for the time. So keep him in your prayers as well on this feast day. Anyway, thank you for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.